Hello everybody, uh, my name is Dara Ryder, I am CEO of AHEAD and I'm here today with my colleagues Dr Richard Healy, Dr Vivian Rath and Jess Dunn and the titan of teaching and learning that is Dr Marion McCarthy who's taught me so much about pedagogy and inclusion over the years. Uh, Jess, the two of us are swimming in doctors so we're going to have to represent each other and, and stay close today. But, uh, so I'd like to welcome you all to the AHEAD uh, Members Winter Webinar Series 2021. And a huge thank you to the members of AHEAD who support our mission and to engage with us all in all sorts of real and meaningful ways to improve access and inclusion for people with disabilities in their institution. So just before we get started, a few housekeeping bits. Uh, so if you require closed captions today, they are available by clicking the CC button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom window. And a big thanks to our captioner, Karen, is providing the professional captions here today. If you want to engage with us and each other during the session, there are a number of ways to do so. So you can do so in the chat box, which is the most suitable place really to add comments or share thoughts with the rest of the participants in the session today. And in fact, if you'd like to feel free to share where you're joining the session from today into the chat box now, if you wish to get the conversation flowing, that would be absolutely great. And be sure if you do want everybody to see or comments that you change the default target for your chat in the drop down menu just above the chat box from panelists to everyone otherwise only we'll see your message as the host on the panelist. So if you have a question to ask the panelists directly during the sessions please pop this one into the Q&A box which is just separately down on your Zoom window and we'll get to them at the end of each contribution that uh, we go through today. So that's where we'll be keeping an eye for questions so please avoid putting questions into the chat as we may miss them. And then later on towards the end of the session, we'll also be using a tool called Mentimeter to gather your thoughts on what you think is the most important takeaway from the pandemic regarding inclusion in education. So please let that question simmer away in the background and we'll show you how to enter those thoughts later on in the session. And lastly, if you're using Twitter and you're tweeting about your thoughts today, be sure to tag at Ahead Ireland in your tweet so that we can see your tweet and we can engage with it. So today is a very exciting day in Ahead because we're releasing two reports reports into the world. One is a research report which is examining the experiences of students with disabilities in the learning from home context and another is a report from Vivian and Marion who many of you will remember did an amazing double act at the AHEAD conference rapporteurs earlier on this year and that report is really on the key themes which are emerging from all the contributions to that event and what they mean for our policy and practice going forward. So firstly myself and my colleague Dr Richard Healy who's the, the uh, key researcher on the learning from home project will go through the findings of that report We'll take a few questions before we move on to Marion and Vivian, who are going to have a discussion about those key themes and summarise them for the audience. And then four of, all four of us will come back together at the end and we'll get your thoughts on the most important takeaways from the pandemic in terms of educational inclusion and reflect on them. And so I don't really want to waste any more time uh, on our introduction. So I'm going to get right into the first contribution and I'm going to, uh, hopefully you can all see the, the contribution on screen now. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Richard Healy. How are you keeping, Richard? Good afternoon, Dara. It's a pleasure to be here today to um, finally bring this research to the masses. Uh, it's a big day for you. Uh, a lot it of is. hard work gone in. It is. And we would like to thank uh, Dr. Conor McGuckin for his, his, um, his help throughout. Um, this is the, our Learning From Home research that's gone live on our website today. So we've 20 minutes to go through what is essentially a 100 page research project. So it's a brief discussion. We will introduce the research. We will discuss the methodology, how we elicited this data from 729 different participants. We will look at a key theme that permeated much of the data and that we had a mixed experiences and desires which really uh, shows you that a diverse range of learners cannot be treated in a uniform manner. So we will also be discussing a broad range of findings that we found. Um, we will be discussing coping. We will be discussing accessibility. We will be discussing the digital divide, communication and supports and hopes for the future. And then we will go on through a brief synopsis of our recommendations and findings that emerged from our data. Um, the, so our methodology first, so the survey is informed by quantitative data that was collected from 729 um, surveys that were carried out across three different program types. Now you will hear us discussing program types throughout and when we discuss program types we're talking about higher education undergrad, higher education postgrad and FET. And the, the survey itself compared it had 18 questions which and which some of them consisted of sub questions and some of these were identical to last year to allow for year on year benchmark and a comparison with last year's study. 
Now, last year we had 601 participants, this year we had 729. All, re all recognised disability categories were, were represented and all counties in the Republic of Ireland were represented by at least one participant. Now, as an experienced researcher, this key theme was something that frustrated me at the start, and I will discuss it, um, Eric, because it's very important. Um, so, when you're used to dealing with a lot of um, 729 surveys, so lots of data. Um, the first thing a researcher does looks for trends, looks for patterns, looks for commonalities throughout the research. And something that frustrated me at the very start, I remember speaking to Darren numerous days about it, was that the words I was using was ambivalent and ambiguous, and I couldn't find any you know, really true, um, strong findings. I was getting the slight majority, significant minority um, dynamic so what I seen as a weakness in the research of force actually became one of its major strengths because this highlights diversity within the, the community of students with disabilities, that even within that community, there is different needs, different circumstances, different experiences, different desires, and very, very different narratives. And for us, this strengthens the call for the universal design of learning, which I'm sure you're all aware, values flexibility, values accessibility, <clears throat> excuse me, and values a choice to meet variable different needs through multiple, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of expression and action. Yeah, it's a real reminder for us as an organisation that, you know, sometimes because people ask us for our views all the time, what should we do for students with disabilities? You know, and it's it's just almost like it, there is that, that, that sort of temptation to put people in these little boxes. And this is a reminder that even when we do that within those tiny boxes, there's all sorts of humans living in there with all sorts of different experiences and desires. And uh, what's interesting about some of the research that we'll talk about now is that the, the disability factors within those are actually do, do actually change people's responses to some of the questions in terms of the types of disability and stuff like that as well. Well, I discussed some of our findings and our first finding was coping and we, we, we asked, um, I wouldn't say we asked, we presented students with this very broad statement of I am coping well with learning from home and we asked them to gauge this or rate this through a range of different choices that range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and although it is a very like a subjective adjective coping, I mean, it's a, it's a massive question across all um, program types and disability categories, we found a very welcome finding that in comparison with last year, when we found 24% of participants were reported they were coping well with learning from home. This year, 41% stated they were coping well with learning from home. But we still had this alarming 42% that were not coping, stated they were not coping from home. And again, this is really amplifying that dynamic of no significant majority again. And this would have been very much disability dependent as well. Um, coping, those who, um, who identified as having mental health um, were almost twice as likely to not be coping as those who identified as being blind or visually impaired. And it's also very dependent on program type, whereas last year we would have found that students who were doing FET courses were most likely to be coping well. This year it was students in higher education who were, who were beginning to catch up, for want of a better way of putting it, coping well. And that students with postgrad were more likely to be coping well, and students with undergrad, post higher education undergrad were at least likely to be coping well with 39%. Now, a caveat that I have to attach to this is that we have never asked students before how they are coping well with learning. With learning. So really findings we might emerge from this in future research when we can ask a cohort of students how they are coping with third level territory learning and then make a comparison <coughs> with learning from home. <coughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think Vivian, your microphone is still on there. If you wouldn't mind uh, muting, that would be fantastic. Um, but uh, no, I think uh, one of the things uh, from this you're, you're kind of highlighting there, Richard, I, I suppose from my own, as a personal reflection, from my own thinking, I'm beginning to think much more and more about how much our students or how many students are just not coping as a, a matter of course in higher education and what we can do about that, in particular through design. So I think we're going to talk a little bit after the session, uh, myself, about how our next conference coming up in 2022 and how some of these findings today are actually informing that as well. Very much so there. And we, as I 
although the surveys were informed by quantitative survey data, we did give every participant a, an option to add some qualitative data in the form of what we call notable comments. And these very much highlight this dynamic or dichotomy through of positive negative. Okay, so when we asked students how they coped, this student said gave this as their notable comment. Learning from home has worked really well for me in so many ways. Not having to travel to college on the days I feel the worst physically has meant I have missed far less classes than last year. Yeah, and then we see uh, the students almost giving the opposite uh, reflection. I cannot function as a student at home and online classes do not work for me at all. I mean, it's very strong language, isn't it? I cannot function as a student at home. So you have, the, again, these really different dynamics. And I think that's what Richard was alluding to earlier. earlier you know, it's, it's a real note for us that we need to respond with this flexibility and choice if we're to meet the needs of both of these students in, uh, right here, but in general of our groups of students with disabilities and in great, indeed our, the whole cohort that we deal with. So we also looked at accessibility. So we asked the question, do you think learning online has resulted in a more or less accessible experience for you than on-campus learning? And what was really interesting is that we found half uh, actually stated that they found learning from home less accessible, but one third found it more accessible. So again, exactly the same dynamic that Richard has been alluding to, this uh, you know slight majority, significant minority. And um, But what was really interesting is that this is quite uh, heavily different for different disability types. So you're much more likely to find it less or more accessible depending on what disability category uh, you identify in. So just as an example, um, all of these are broken down in much more detail in the report. But as an example, uh, only one third of those with a significant ongoing illness found learning from home to be less accessible than on-campus learning. But almost two thirds of students with a speech and language difficulty found it less accessible to be, uh, to be learning from home. So, you know, you get these huge differences and variability within the disability community and how they're responding to that. Uh, also, with regards to accessibility, we asked whether they felt that their teachers or lecturers had considered accessibility in the online materials that they had been provided with when learning from home. And again, we got, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite a significant number. We said almost half who said that their accessibility had been considered by their teachers. So that, that's the good news. But again, there's quite significant uh, minorities who are saying that, that, that it hasn't. Um, and I think the comments highlighted in particular, the quality of data around this highlighted that this is very much teacher dependent. So it's one teacher or lecturer to the next is getting a very, very different experience. So I suppose that thinks that makes us think about the kind of structures and the policies and the procedures for how we can provide more oversight in these areas. And interestingly, uh, students in FET programs actually felt are perceived the accessibility of the materials they're providing with as to be significantly more accessible or that their lecturers had considered accessibility, should I say, in designing the materials much more so. So you can see in the program graph here on, on screen, what you're seeing is that 71% of FED students reacted positively in comparison to 52% of HE postgrads and 43% of HE undergrads. So that's something for the sectors to model over. Um, just in terms of the qualitative data, so you'll notice that after all these sections, we're going to drop in and give some, some students from the data, uh, representative students, some voice within this. So two uh, comments that stuck out to us again, or one, the first one here, I feel a combination of the lecturers that I can go back and play again. And in brackets here, I'm not a speedy note taker because they are videos. That has been such a massive improvement for my learning. So sometimes we think of the recording thing as more about flexibility of when people engage uh, in the classroom. But actually, this student is highlighting that the recording piece is actually a key study tool for review as well. And again, we're highlighting that dichotomy again that this student said that the design of assessments, all written work. I am so worried. I really wish we could have done more interactive assessments. And this would have been taken into account. So again, we're seeing that this mu these multiple means of expression, engagement, um, are the, the call again for UDL being highlighted again here and that one student f found it accessible, one student found it very inaccessible. So we're talking about different narratives, narratives different experiences. Another one of our, <clears throat> excuse me again, another one of our primary findings was assistive technologies on the digital divide. And we found a very welcome increase in assistive technology. You've got to remember, this is a snapshot from April 2021. And we have earlier research from last year, as I said a while ago, to compare this with. And we found this really welcome increase of 26% to 40% of participants who are now using assistive technology. And this was accompanied by a decrease of 
28 to 16 percent of students who are having difficulties using assistive technology. So not only did we see an increase in students using AT, we also seen a decrease in students having difficulties using these ATs. Um, again, like all of our findings, I would argue, um, the use of AT is very disability dependent. We have three quarters of students who are visually impaired um, using AT, whereas only one quarter of those with a significant ongoing illness use assistive technologies. Um, in the qualitative section of this um, part of the report, we this is where we found we found that that sixteen percent who are still having difficulty using that's a, that's a significant amount. That's almost one in five who are having difficulty in engaging with assistive technologies, employing assistive technologies, and using assistive technologies. And in the qualitative data, we found that a number of students had turned off some of the features, and a number of students had turned off the technology altogether. Which for me. If we are going to have these national funding streams that are going to enable students to use AT, we've got to have some bespoke training attached to this to allow these students to use the AT, use ATs to their potential. And actually, as well, the quality of that, if you don't mind I me mean, jumping in, which is also highlighted that when when students were provided this, they responded very well to it. When they were provided training by the access service, we had some quality of that in there to suggest that that was actually working really well. But there was definitely a sense from some of the uh, the quality of findings that students had been given a device and didn't really know how to use it at all. Uh, you know, so that there's definitely something about the uh, looking at the the return on investment for institutions, and that definitely this training piece is is important if they're going to get the return on investment in those technologies. It would have been one of our recommendations at the end that we we'll probably discuss again later on. Um, traditionally, when research looks at um, the digital divide, we usually talk about laptop access or PC access. Um, we found that 98% of participants had access to a laptop or a PC, a PC the same as last year. What, where we did see a change was a decrease in those sharing their device of 24 to 8 percent, a significant decrease, which is in which highlights the success of potentially highlights the success of national funding streams like the laptop loan scheme and the mitigating education disadvantage fund. Now, we would have taken a more nuanced view of the divide here because we believe if we are going to look at the decline in the digital divide and specifically if we're going to examine learning from home, we need to look at the home environment when we are looking at this divide in um, digital accessibility. So we would have, I haven't, in this 20 minute presentation, I can't really go into these, but I, I will urge you to engage with our research online and look a little bit more into these. But the nuances that we use, the lenses that we use to fully explore this divide, we would have looked at the home environment, we would have, would have looked at privacy, we would have, would have looked at comfort, and we would have looked at accessibility to broadband. And we would have found that across the four of them lenses that on average, one in five rated it as being below average. So. These things need to be looked at if we are going to continue this commendable work, which we have evidence based from two findings that we see as being done in the decline of the digital divide. Now, when we looked at supports and challenges, um, we found that over half of participants stated that they were struggling with self-motivation and they were so struggling to structure their day. I think 59% said they were struggling to motivate themselves and 53% of participants said they were struggling to structure their learning day or their day of study. We asked a range of questions around supports. Supports are vital to students with disabilities and in particular supports are vital with students with disabilities when learning from home. In particular quick access or engagement with learning from home or with um, support services. So we found across these questions that we asked, we asked three different questions. I mean, one of the findings that we found is that a majority, 60 to 62%, had a good experience with support services and the implementation of supports. But again, we have this significant minority of 19 to 24% who did not. That's potentially one in four to one in five who did not have a good experience of access and um, support services from while learning from home. And they would have cited in the qualitative data had a um, long response times when trying to access supports and um, frequently delayed needs assessments. Now, another caveat that we have to attach here as 
when we look into other past research from ahead and cogent research needs to do this, we need to look at support services. And we have found in our other research that support services are under-resourced. They have self-reported to be understaffed and under-resourced. We have found a very welcome statistic in that 220, there has been a 220% increase in students with disabilities now engaging with um, third level education. But we have not seen the same corresponding increase in support services. So that's the caveat that we also need to look at here as well. And that we, if we want to be doing fair research for once, better word that we need to be looking at all different factors that um, interact with um, support services. And again, we have this dichotomy when we look at the qualitative data and that this student said it took them, it took students, it took the support services three months of me constantly emailing them to finally get an answer and a meeting with my disability support officer. So someone who's not very happy with the support service there. Yeah, I think uh, I mean, that, that sort of uh, commentary highlights very well with that previous finding that the number of staff uh, in these, within these services is not keeping up proportionally with the, with the growth in the services there because you know, we know from our own engagements that they're, they're very overstretched, especially this time of year when needs assessments could take place almost right up until the end of November in some institutions. Um, so that's, a, that's a very, uh, something that would chime with our own experiences. But you can see on the positive side, on the other side of it here, I've informed the college and I do feel I've attained some extra benefits, for example, extra time in exams. So here's a student who is seeing the benefits of engaging with the support services as well. So just to look at uh, the kind of future hopes for our students. Uh, so we asked them, I suppose, what is their preferred mode of learning in a post-COVID environment? You know, what would they actually like to see as their preferred modes of learning? And, and so interestingly, one half want to return to mostly on-campus learning. So almost if you like one half saying they'd like to return to a bit like the, the status quo of, uh, of what was there pre-pandemic. But one half either want a much uh, more varied activity, uh, set of activities between learning from home activities and on-campus learning activities. So uh, we look at blended learning, I've said 39% in that. Or indeed, there is a cohort who actually would prefer to remain fully online. And 9%, you know, it's, it's, it's a significant, you know, small but significant number. Um, and I suppose that really tells us that we have to really think about how we provide more options for students and how they engage with learning that way. So really, from a structural point of view, both the FET and HE system really you need to be considering how we make those uh, more blended opportunities, more hybrid opportunities uh, for, for students to happen and indeed to actually look at more fully online programs so students have real choice in how they engage with their learning. We also um, rate, asked um, students to rate a list of 10 statements um, in terms of whether they were high, pri high priority, medium priority or low priority in terms of access and inclusion to education going forward. So these are typically statements looking at policy and practice at a, across a national level. Uh, so what was really interesting, and as I said, you can dive deeper in the report, have a look at those 10 statements. What was really interesting is the three statements that were rated as highest, and I say are the three statements that the most, statements, uh, the most students rated as a high priority, where the retention of recorded and captioned lectures at 88% and um, were providing more variety and choice for students in how they're assessed and how they can go about meeting their learning outcomes at 78% and providing more accessibility awareness training for all staff. And that was at 77%. And just two things that stuck out here. One is that the, the gap between the retention of recorded and captioned lectures and the, and the, the sort of next one down as the, as the percentage gap there, you know, is quite significant. So that it's definitely a very, very clear priority, this whole aspect of recording and the benefits that students uh, kind of, uh, you know, incurred from that. So that's a really important one for the sector. If we're going to try and listen to the student voice and build that in and actually make sure that we respond to it, then that's a key one for us to, to highlight. Uh, but what also stood out is that all of these top three were actually rated as higher priorities or more students rated them as high priorities than much more tangible individual benefits. So there was things on the list, for example, that were more in relation to increased personal individual grants or increased disability funding. So, you know, things maybe that might be more tangible benefits for them and individuals it actually shows that the, the culture and the pedagogy bit is actually really high on the students' lists. And sometimes we, I think we can miss that as, as people working in inclusion, that, you know, you can often think of UDL as this thing that's actually more concerned with the sector and that the students aren't maybe as, as kind of tuned into it. 
but the students actually telling us here that these pedagogical tools and supports are very, very vital for them and are actually more important to them than, than some other aspects of it that you might consider to be more important than the face of it. And that was something that was echoed across a range of research projects throughout the pandemic as well, Dara. We, we, the um, IUA research and studentsurvey.ie would have found that the retention of recorded and captioned lectures was very high on the priority list for all students. Absolutely. And I suppose the, what we see here is the quality of the, the stakes, the, the emotional human stakes for these things. So the first one here, we have one thing I, I miss from having things be online. No memory alone based exams. In first year, I failed my psychology exams and scraped passes in my criminology ones. Now in second year, in both of my subjects for the end of term assignments, I've been top five to 10 of my year. So sometimes we can think about, again, these things about this flexibility, this UDL thing as something that's nice for students but actually what this student is highlighting here is that these are critical measures for inclusion and they're also cri critical measures for quality because this is the same student the same modules the same learning outcomes different assessment instrument and that proves really to me that we need to be embedding this uh, this this choice of, of assessment pathways and choice of ways that students can meet uh, their their learning outcomes in order to to provide fair opportunity for everyone to demonstrate what they know a profound quotation, and I think this one is, uh, is too, Dara. Ensuring all lectures are recorded, the student is pleading, this, this, please, the amount of extra emotional and physical harm I put myself through, forcing myself to get to class because I was already behind, and the only person missing out was me. I don't want anyone else to be let down and not have the opportunity to, stu to study because of, health, because of a health issue keeping them from classes. It's not right. Yeah, it's very, very powerful, isn't it? Mm. I suppose that one tells you again that we, we can think about recording as just this thing where students want to, oh, it's, a, it's a nice it's a nice one for students to be able to engage. But what this student is telling us is that this is actually almost a health issue for them, you know? And we've proven that this is doable, this is achievable. And so for, the, for these students, if we're serious about uh, emotional and physical well-being for our students, that this is actually a support to en enable us to, to achieve a better outcome for them. A very low cost accommodation too. So we 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 had a, a range of um, recommendations that I'd urge you to check to have a look at the when you delve deep into the research. So here's four that we felt that we uh, a real synopsis of our key recommendations. Our recommendations are broken into two: international recommendations and the key recommendations aimed at institutions. So we called for the retention of recorded lectures. We called for national and institutional commitment to more options in. The mode of learning so an online a choice between online blended or hybrid learning so we're calling for choice in learning there a commitment to the udl approach so meeting diversity with flexibility accessibility and choice and more at training for students and um, disability awareness and accessibility training for staff is something that really chimed in the qualitative data as well dara i think you remember that came out very strongly in the qualitative data and that many of the students called for disability awareness for staff so these are there's a, a brief selection of our key recommendations from the project yeah and i think they're very much those uh, last pieces are going to very much inform the work plan of ahead next year as well i remember of course we have we have a lot of things in the pipeline around accessibility training and um at training which we'll be able to talk about in the, the coming months um but yeah that's that's very exciting for us so listen uh, both of us are if contactable here uh, richard.healy at ahead.ie or dara.writer at ahead.ie if you have any questions about the uh, report that would be fantastic um i'm hoping to just see is there a q a uh, so we have a question from the audience about what's the difference between a hybrid and blending, uh, blended learning modes. So the difference between hybrid and a blending learning mode is basically that blended learning is a mix of activities that's structured so that essentially everybody in the class is taking activities either from home at one point and in campus at one point. So the program is laid out so that you can uh, act, you can engage remotely at one time and then in another activity, you'll be engaging in person. So for example, it could be that all uh, lectures are online and all tutorials are in campus. Whereas a hybrid uh, mode, which is it's more complicated and more difficult for institutions to implement, but a hybrid mode of learning is basically where it's set up so that students can engage in the activities anywhere they want any of the activities. So for example, where a, a lecture is taking place in person 
and also streamed live online. So people can participate in any way that they choose on any given day. So if you like hybrid learning offers the, the sort of ultimate blend of choice for students. So I, I hope that one's clear. But if there's any other questions on the research, I know there was a, a lot to take in there and I can see some uh, some comments uh, hearing, uh, looking about hearing more about what ahead is planned in, in response to some of this, which is great to see. Um, but if there's no more questions in the room, what we might do, uh, sorry, I have a question actually coming through the chat here. What does AT mean? Sorry, AT is short for a assist of technology. And um, I can see that Mary has asked, can you please give us links to the information on the laptop loan scheme and the mitigating educational disadvantage fund? So just while the next session is going on, Mary, I'll do a little bit of uh, plugging around in the background here and I'll throw some links into the chat for you. And I can see some another uh, comment in the room there saying, well done to all involved, powerful quotes from the students and really highlighting that the students do want UDL. Um, so at this stage, we might uh, move on to, or begin to move on to the next session. So I suppose just to say that, um, Really just to thank Richard as well, because this is Richard's uh, first big research report uh, for AHEAD and he's done a mar marvellous job on it and it's just such a tre treasure trove of information. So just to say a big thank you to you, Richard. Fantastic job. Thanks, sir. I know uh, my colleague uh, Jess is hopefully going to drop the links of the research into the chat now so people can explore it in much more depth at a later point. And it's really important to say that the qualitative and quantitative findings of both reports that we are releasing today have really influenced the team of conference 2022 overhead which is actually called safe haven or stormy port and it's all really about exploring how tertiary education design impacts health and well-being so the call for six minute lightning contributions to that conference or indeed digital posters which are another format you can explore is still open and i think jess is going to share the link for that now for those interested in submitting so we're going to jump now from one conference to the next and i'd like to introduce my colleagues dr marion mccarty and dr vivian ratt and i'm really looking forward to hearing about the collective learning from conference 2021 which is contained in another ahead report released today which i think jess will also pop into the the link into the chat. So welcome guys. Thank you very much Dara and that was a fantastic presentation and so much uh, information there I'll tell you uh, it's a, a hard act to follow Marion uh, <laughs> here this afternoon. Um, I, I'd just like to uh, thank you all for joining us for the launch of the AHEAD uh, Conference Report 2021 Reconnection, titled Reconnection, Placing Inclusion at the Heart of Online Learning and Support. Uh, and just again to, to remind everybody to get their abstracts in for the AHEAD Conference 2022 Safe Haven or Stormy Port and the information is online. As mentioned, I am Vivian Rath and I'm joined by my co-rapporteur uh, extraordinaire, uh, Dr. Marion McCarty. Uh, and we were tasked uh, with uh, reporting on this, what was a huge uh, conference. Uh, and the conference took place uh, online over five weeks uh, during the middle of the pandemic. And of course, this was a head second uh, pandemic conference, if you like, uh, with 291 attendees, 108 contributors from across 10 countries. This one of a head was, was one of a head's largest and most successful uh, events. Uh, the conference was divided into five weekly themes, uh, and although Marion and I would like to discuss all of those themes today, the time will not allow, and so we will focus on three main themes we identified in the discussion, namely community and engagement, cultural engagement, online re learning resources, and Marion will bring it all to conclusion then. But Marion, maybe you'd like to give our guests some idea of how we reached uh, those uh, three themes that we're going to discuss. Yes, well, again, welcome to everyone. And uh, we're delighted to be at this stage of the process. And uh, we spent many long hours uh, reviewing all of the work over the five weeks and, and putting together this report. And um, what's interesting is in, in terms of the methodology, uh, we were trying to work out how could we be, if you like, true to, um, full picture all the time if you like week one in terms of the five weeks for example so we looked at first of all we focused in on the keynotes and then uh, we also triangulated that with the presentations and finally then we had the the mentimeter uh, which we're going to use also i understand today at the end of this uh, conference um so the mentimeter gave your responses you in the audience um 
weekly. So that was the key thing, the triangulation of those. So we had three points of entry from the keynote to the presentations themselves to the response from the audience. And um, we try to keep that triangle, if you like, in mind each week in order to consolidate what was being said, but also to, you know, to make it coherent and to reflect the, the reality on the ground. So um, they were the three things, if you like, that influenced uh, our overarching themes, um, which we chose, uh, as um, Vivian said there, you know, we, we, we looked at community and engagement at the online resources and at cultural change. And uh, they're the three things, I suppose, Vivian, that we will discuss now in some detail. And uh, I think you're going to kick us off with a look at the community and engagement piece firstly. Yeah, absolutely. Um... <clears throat> At the beginning of this conference, uh, participants were asked, you know, what do, what did they want to get out of it? Uh, and participants gave, you know, a range of uh, different responses to that. And but generally, participants wanted to increase their knowledge around disability, uh, universal design for learning, and to make real change. But there was also an obvious yearning to connect, uh, and this was expressed uh, through words like community, uh, networking and network, and connections. And I mean, we have to remember this conference was titled Reconnection. And as Marion so put it so well, you know, that reconnection is predicated on the word connection and suggests, and that suggests that there is a disconnection that we are now seeking to restore. And that's what that conference was about. And I think ahead really got this right in terms of they realized that there was this reconnection and we can see that in the Mentimeter data that came through at that time which was great but of course this conference was also about setting new directions uh, it was about opening up the discussion to consider disabled student belonging community identity and a recognition that student voice and social engagement are central to this and we saw that uh, during the pandemic uh, how important it was but of course to form a sense of belonging one must have a connection to something so like a group or you must have a feeling of fit and identity and of trust and there must be a sense of shared connectedness, a feeling of belonging to something. But the physical and social environment uh, must be accessible too. And the conference brought that to us. It demonstrated that. And students must feel they have the right to choose to belong to something and the opportunity to interact with the community. And of course, in the online environment, we must remember that you have the opportunity to interact with that community too. And there was examples of that. One example perhaps was in week four, and I referred to my own uh, presentation around social engagement uh, and disabled students. And in that, I referred to the need for to create a climate of belonging within, in, within institutions. And this must be extended, of course, to, to clubs and societies, the students' union, and of course, college decision making. And this was particularly evident in Keynote 5, uh, in Hargrave's uh, presentation, where he sees identity as inextricably linked to learning. And he says, I can't find my own voice if I don't know who I am or where I belong. And you know, that presentation brought to mind uh, an old school rhyme we used to chant on the bus. Who we are and where do we come from? And I remember that so well. And isn't that so true? That school children all over the country chant that out on buses going to matches or part of their club. They could be from my own club, Buffers Alley, or whether they're from St. Joseph's School down the road. But they all want to know who we are and where do we come from? And I think that still applies. It still applies. So simple. Student engagement and social engagement were shown during the uh, conference to be connected to community and its element of identity and belonging by the many presenters, say from Leicester University, from Maynooth, 
from Trinity uh, and many others, UCD, UCC, etc. And that disabled student engaged social engagement was found to be critical to the formation of connections that result in a sense of belonging. And across the example, there were examples of student voice having a transformative effect across HEI, HEI. And voice was identified by many of the presenters as extremely important. And we began to see across the keynotes and in the presentations that the UDL principle of engagement is codependent on understanding people as well as pedagogy and technology, something we've just heard Dara uh, speaking about earlier on. From this conference, we have witnessed the benefits of the wider engagement of students to the formation of connections that result in a sense of belonging. But of course, community didn't just, it's not just associated with the students, it's also associated with staff. And we saw the importance of staff free connections with the conference. And through the weekly sessions, the staff began to realize that they weren't just individuals, that they were all part of a larger community of learning. And we saw many examples of great practice where communities of learners, ac academic staff and uh, administrative staff all came together to move forward and to bring new ideas and create a real sense of community of practice that had developed among participants over the five weeks. Marion, I let you continue with the second team. Thanks a million. Um, so our second theme uh, then came to the whole notion of cultural change and the cultural shift. Now, this is a highly complex construct that exists on many levels. And um, just to put it in, in context for you, and Vivian and I talked a lot about this and it, it became quite clear as well in some of the responses um, in the Menti over the five weeks. Um, the move really is from, first of all, when we go back, let's say, over the years, and thank heaven we've had many of them with the head. Initially, we were all trying to understand, let's say, the whole idea of UDL in itself. So trying to understand the concepts of UDL. And then we graduated to begin to understand that in our own practice. And for many years, for example, Dr. Brian Butler, um, who's, I think, attending this uh, session as well. So, Brian, welcome in particular to you, my great colleague as well over the years. And um, we'd be presenting every year at the AHEAD conference and trying to show what was happening at UCC and how we were coping and how we were trying to change the pedagogy. So we moved, in other words, from the UDL concepts to then individual uh, understanding, as it were, of it in our practice and then to our case studies. And then we moved on more, let's say, to the departmental and disciplinary focus within each institution. And then to the national um, picture, uh, both the way in which AHEAD was leading us there and the national conferences every year, but also then when the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning came on board and we had, for example, the digital badge, um, which we're rolling out in UCC and which so many other institutions are. So you see there the shift in the culture from the concept itself to the individual response of the practice to the national response. Now, this is what I'm talking about with cultural shift. And now what we need ultimately in that cultural shift is the institutional transformation. And of course, we have that beginning already um, in the sense that so many universities, for example, and third level institutes have um, accredited programs for staff and teaching and learning in higher education um, and accredited programs as well, let's say in the digital badge um, in UDL and so on. But not only are we talking of that, but also let's say of the transformation of HEIs institutionally from the top down as well as the bottom up. Now, this is the cultural shift that we felt became very clear in the conference. And this is the whole sustainability argument. We can't move forward much further now unless we are going to transform higher education from the top down as well as the bottom up. And that means, for example, making sure that uh, we are thinking of diversity and inclusion, let's say, in the actual strategic plans of the university. And indeed in the structures, like for example, many institutions now have, um, you know, institutes of equality uh, and inclusion. And, and this is an excellent move. Uh, so this is what we're talking about now. 
what came out in the data as well, there are many other um, aspects of the cultural shift, uh, perhaps on a more individual level, like people, for example, worried about time. They didn't have the time, they said, to make these changes. And, you know, we have to look as well at changing the mindset around time. And indeed, also, of course, giving people time, let's say, to do the digital badge uh, and to, to get themselves up to speed, for example, with UDL, which is our main pedagogical armory in bringing about diversity and inclusion. Um, people also, there was a certain fear. That was another um, cultural thing that people were afraid maybe to take a risk to try and move. And we often say that in a head, to the small steps, take a small step at a time. So that was another one. Another was, you know, even raising awareness with the in, in the institution that that very much helps uh, towards our cultural shift. Also, the idea of thinking of yourself as part of a team and as working collaboratively rather than individually. And that's a very powerful way of bringing about change for you can change the universe really on your own, though, of course, you can play a very good part in it. Um, the other thing I suppose that came across was the idea of demystifying UDL in itself. And I think over the years, um, Head has made a wonderful job of that. But firstly, the term perhaps can seem um, you know, complex uh, for people. But, uh, you know, as, as earlier Richard said um, in, in the other presentation, you know, diversity is, is not about uh, the same thing for everyone. You know, uh, you have to think of the fact that people learn in different ways and that we have to assess them in different ways and that we have to teach in different ways. So these kind of cultural shifts um, are vital if, if we are going really to maximize um, UDL and to maximize like, um, you know, our, our conference it gives us the title Reconnection. We have to reconnect, um, you know, with ourselves and with the whole notion of what teaching and learning is. And uh, with the fact that pedagogy cannot say the same forever in a traditional mode. Um, so lots of cultural shifts um, with great support there for us and, um, you know, ahead already, let's say we're in the next conference, Vivian. We've had a little time to draw our breath and we're moving on, which is great. So Vivian, back to you now to talk about our third. Theme. Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, acts to segue quite nicely into our third uh, team, uh, online learning resources. And in order for us to make that shift, Marion, we need support and those out there need support. And there, through the conference and over the course of the conference, we saw the many different uh, range of supports online that exist. Those, uh, one of prime key example uh, of fertile resource, there are heads AT Hive, uh, which Trevor launched here a couple of weeks, relaunched a couple of weeks ago, and which is a fantastic resource for supporting staff and students to, to make those shift and to utilize technology to the full. It provides numerous resources that inform a holistic education that blends pedagogy and technology for the benefit of all. But of course, there were many more. We had the, uh, ex the uh, an explanation and a a deeper dive into the web accessibility guide, guidelines. And they may pre seem prescriptive on the surface, but they ensure that all can have access and ensure learning is inclusive for all. Examples again, a HEADS digital badge, which has acted to bring together further education and training and higher education uh, under that umbrella of UDL and its shared learning there again. There are many different resources. And again, I could go through them all here today, but we don't have time. But the key thing about it is that we see from uh, the survey today that a head survey that 88% of respondents students refer, referenced the statement to ensure that all class lectures are recorded and captioned so students can watch them back later as being a high priority. Will we listen to the student voice? We certainly have the tools. There's more, many resources out there to do it. We, there are many challenges to doing it, uh, but we must listen to the student voice, I think. But I'm going to pass Marion over to Marion now to, to bring this uh, to a conclusion. So I suppose finally, when, when we were um, thinking about writing the conclusion, uh, we thought maybe it's very good to stand back and imagine that we were you know, in a drone above the, uh, above the conference. And what you see then 
um, when you look at it, uh, as it were, from the air, is the fact that UDL is very much a shape changer. But it undulates, you know, through so many pathways um, and provides opportunities for people literally to reconnect with themselves, um, with their pedagogy, with their institution. Um, you know, it, it's a very much a relational concept as well, uh, UDL, uh, not something, just some kind of external imposed pedagogy. Rather, as um, Vivian was saying earlier there, it's all linked into your identity as well. You have to identify with yourself and who you are and your needs and your voice. And I think this comes out very clearly as well in our in earlier report now on uh, pandemic learnings um, when Richard and Dara were talking people uh, we see are feeling isolated students at home um, and uh, part of the reason I think is some of the issues that come up in our conference um, align very well with that with the fact that uh, you know if you can't find your voice and your sense of identity if you can't express yourself the way you need to uh, let's say in too many memory-based tests and that then of course you are alienated um, and can't really connect and this is one of the things that comes across, I think, in our report as well, you know, on the macro and holistic level. Um, I suppose it's very important, like looking in there, in other words, from the student's point of view, one thing we haven't mentioned so far is the wonderful artwork that we found so useful during our Mentimeter sessions in order to stimulate thinking. Uh, in the conference the year before, when we had in 2019, um, uh, there was a wonderful um, series of artworks by our students in, at a head. And you'll see these referenced, as, uh, referenced in the appendix to the report. And they also give the names of the artists. But one of the images was a student, you know, heading out to college, let's say, on, on Grafton Street. And you felt on the one hand that the student was, you know, powering forward and that uh, the educational experience would be empowering for them and that they would be able to cope. Um, now, on the other hand, because the, the student is holding a stress ball, some people felt, look, maybe the student actually is under pressure. And we had some very good um, discussion about that. Uh, so that kind of gives you what Richard was talking about earlier there, that kind of dichotomy and that ambivalent response. On the one hand, we want the student to be empowered, to have voice, to have direction. Um, on the other hand, there's a vulnerability and um, uh, there's a fear and, uh, you know, and, and these things we have to try at an institutional level to ensure that we remove those barriers in so far as we can. Um, I suppose, you know, another thing to say and thinking as well of what you said there, Vivian, earlier about, um, you know, uh, the last keynote, um, Hargreaves and also uh, Louis Perez one. Uh, the whole notion, uh, and uh, indeed coming from David Rose initially, this idea of the fact that teaching is emotional work. This comes uh, very much into the picture. We are teaching and our students are learning and uh, co-producing the work with us, you know, with the heart as well as the head. And this comes very much across, I think, as a key theme throughout the report. Um, you know, so we have to, in that sense, reconnect with ourselves um, as learners, but also then we have to reconnect as teachers with our students. And we have to be aware of the fact that, you know, what is the personal literacy as well that we have? Um, you know, the working of the heart and the voice, as, as he put it so well, Hargreaves, you know, that unless I know myself really, what can I, what can I know, you know? And um, so this is the reconnection is happening on so many levels. And I was saying earlier in relation to the cultural aspect, the reconnection has to happen as well at the heart of the institution in the very strategic plans we put before our university in its vision and its mission. Um, so I think ultimately I, I, I'd, I'd end by saying, look, the major thing, we're back to that, that cultural shift that, you know, if we are going to be sustainable moving forward, and this is a huge aspect now where and everything across from climate change and learning environment and so on. What is sustainable? And what is sustainable is uh, a change in mindset, which is at once on the individual level, but also on the systematic and infrastructural level. And I suppose it's that word infrastructure that comes out in the conference, let's say more than in other years, 
uh, because over the, and it has taken a good decade for us to move from understanding Uriel, the concept of it. And of course, there's a vast literature to help us further uh, to understand that. But we go from that level to where we are now, which is a very advanced and sophisticated state, where we are now able to say, look, that infrastructure, those changes are actually happening before our eyes. And we look forward next year in, in, in the next conference to seeing, in fact, how that will play out. And particularly, we can see already emergent, both in the pandemic learnings, um, you know, the, the learning from home discussion and ours, that we are talking very much as well about student well-being, student resilience, student reconnection, that personal uh, voice, that, that resilience, but none of that can come. You see in, in Richard's report earlier and Dara's where they're talking there about the fact that some students felt they, they weren't supported. So we need to find the many ways in which we can support them. And this is why from our perspective of reconnection uh, and, and, and at our conference, what we detected was an appetite for change and an understanding that change is a multi-level process and must happen both, uh, if you like, at the level of the pedagogy, at the level of individual, at the level of the department, at the level of the national and the international, but above all, one tiny change, if you like, in the infrastructural level, about opening up that flexibility in our institutional thinking and strategic plans will take us miles further and we look forward to that being more advanced and it is already happening so we are very grateful for that thanks right thank you very much guys for that and um, great contribution uh, i think uh, i think what i'm getting from some of it is that you know what we have here is uh, what we have is the importance of both strategy and practice and um, and I think both of those things are, are really important um, in, in moving things forward. If it was at the famous, um, at the famous uh, sort of business uh, st strategic person, I'm not sure his, his name, I think it's Peter Drucker is maybe his name, who said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, so you kind of need both of these things to, uh, to, to run alongside each other. So I, I suppose there's two messages here. One is that we, they, I suppose they're, they're intertwined, right? We can't do one without the other. Um, and they're, they're both sort of symbiotic in this practice. So I wouldn't want people who feel they're out of the conversation of strategy in the room here today to think that they have no power in this because actually it begins with the individual and it, it subsumes the whole organization. Um, you know, so it needs to be a, a top down and bottom up approach to make these things work. And um, so I suppose we're, what we're going to do is close the session here today by involving the realm. Richard, if you wouldn't mind um, unmuting yourself, that would be great. We're going to ask the realm yourselves, uh, those of you in the room, what is the most important takeaway for you from the pandemic regarding inclusion in education? So we're going to ask you for one takeaway, and I've just posted into the chat box here, and I'm going to share my screen to make this easier to see for a moment. So we're going to capture this data via Menti. Uh, so basically, you can use the link, which is in the chat box now, to go direct if you're using the same device, or if it's easier and you're using maybe a mobile, separate mobile device, you can go to menti.com, and you can use this code here which is one four three six eight nine and we're asking you just to input your own thoughts about the single most important takeaway for you from the pandemic regarding inclusion and education you only have 250 characters so think about being brief and concise and giving us a uh, something that will really make us think about um, our practice going forward and while we're waiting for people to come in there, I'm actually just going to uh, have a little chat with my colleagues here and ask them the question. So I'm going to start, I'm going to put you on the spot, Vivian. Uh, you're, you're sitting there muted, so I'm picking on you for that reason. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, what's your most important takeaway from the pandemic regarding inclusion and education? I was just thinking, though, Dara, just before I say that, that and you're mentioning Drucker. Drucker also said that the first thing you do is you get the right people on the bus and you face the bus in the right direction. And uh, so people first uh, is the, the important thing there. Uh, it's about getting the people and getting the people on, on the same vision uh, and believing in the same vision uh, as the whole institution. So I think that's an absolutely critical part to it as well uh, and getting that bus in the right direction. 
In terms of answering... Before, before you go there, I mean, just so I just see that Danielle said that the says voting is closed. I think that should be fixed now, Danielle, so you can all get back to furiously entering your menti codes. But if you're having any trouble accessing that, just pop them into the chat and we'll respond to them there. Sorry, Vivian, go ahead. No problem. Uh, that's it. In, in terms of answering your question, I think the thing that stands out for me in relation to it is... Uh, that change is possible and that we can bring about change much quicker than we ever thought was possible uh, because there are many things happen that happened during the pandemic in relation to learning uh, for students, uh, for all students, that disabled people have been calling for for years. And one example was the use of uh, online learning. Uh, and, and that was something that we, and when I say we disabled people, who especially disability rights activists, uh, who have been calling for this uh, and being told, no, that cannot be done. And here we saw that it happened in, in a flash uh, and that was a huge move and a, a, a very successful move uh, to online and to new learning techniques. Uh, so again, the key for me is that change is possible and happens much faster than, than, than we thought. Uh, and that brings me a reminder of uh, a webinar that we had uh, earlier this year on the launch of our employer attitude survey where one of our or one of our contributors Noel Joyce used the brilliant term disabled people can help you predict the future and that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what he was talking about that we often use this thing of if it's good for people with disabilities then it tends to be good for everybody because it, it, it's forcing you to build in that more flexibility more ver to respond to the variability in society uh, so i think that was a great example uh, richard how about yourself what's your what's your key takeaway well, I've no idea who Peter Drucker is, so I can't carry on that, that theme. That you He's a have. management guru, uh, Richard. But I can't quote him, so I can't carry on that <laughs> theme that you have gone there, so I'll have to come up with something else. Um, what, what I did find um, um, from the research and from trying to amplify that student voice and trying to magnify that student voice is that if we are serious about an end step in particular, are serious about these four domains of, of student partnership, that we have to stop expecting students to be passive recipients of knowledge and start expecting them to be um, included in the access, transfer and progression of knowledge in all courses and to allow them to have this voice and that this voice means something. And as you said, Vivian, things that have been said for years were pushed to the fore during the pandemic. And I believe we, if we could... In some, in some way, keep that going and keep encouraging that voice and keep making that voice actually manifest into something tangible because it did happen. There's no reason why we can't keep it going. And as a researcher, I would be really looking forward to some of the, some of the clearer findings that are going to come out in future research that are going to emerge from a lot of our findings in this research, the likes of the coping question, the, like of, the likes of asking students in the future to make an informed decision about learning from home when they have something to compare it to, when they're not stuck at home and not allowed out, but they actually are back and then they're given the choice. Well, do you know what home learning this hybrid choice was actually pretty good. And I think we can come out with some really informed findings then and really start trying to push things on forward for all students and in particular our own members. So you were seeing a lot of the, this dialogue happening now about whether recording is, is now available as a reasonable accommodation. Well, it's, very, it's very hard to make the argument uh, that it's not reasonable if it was happening last year. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that, that's a really interesting one. I think people are definitely, like students' expectations are, are shifting, you know, and there's no doubt about that. It'll be interesting to see going forward whether students start to vote with their feet in terms of where they actually choose, uh, you know, institutions who are actually publicly offering these different choices as, as part of their, you know, their, if you like, their, their pitch, their sales pitch to students about trying to get students in the door. Marion, what's your, your take? Um, I suppose my take following on from what I've been saying earlier is about the fact that, you know, do what is sustainable. This is, I think, the, the key aspect for me that, and indeed, I would say diversity like breeds sustainability because diversity will trump everything else. People will learn in different ways. Our students will thrive in that way. And um, we need, therefore, for example, to have more sustainable ways of assessment. As Richard said earlier, you know, the memory, and there was a frightening quotation from the student who was failing everything when it was a memory test. And then when there was flexibility in the assessment, and he or she could thrive. So I think that still comes to a sustain, you know, do what is sustainable pedagogically and um, what's going to work. And another thing I'd say emerging from that is 
the sustainable nature, if you like, of, of online learning. You know, we, we can't go back now. Um, it's like we have to learn to live with COVID. We have to learn to live also now with online learning and with blended approaches. Some things will work extremely well. I mean, pedagogically, it'll be very sound, let's say, to put a lot of the lectures online. Um, the reason being as well is that then when you do meet the students face to face, as you were talking of Richard earlier as well, whether for a tutorial or, um, uh, you know, in, in class, then you can use, if you like, a much more um, flexible and indeed a flipped classroom approach whereby we get the chance to talk to the students, to hear their voices. This is what they're looking for, to be able to, um, you know, develop that, the, their own voice. And that's one of the things we've treasured at ahead, that we always try to give the student the centre stage as well at our conferences. And there are many aspects where the students take over in terms of the presentation, for example, of the art, the presentation um, of that wonderful poem we had from Blanchardstown some years ago. And um, also the, the fact that they would, you know, lead our conferences. And um, so I think that, you know, what is sustainable about, I mean, good teaching is always about learning, um, you know, otherwise you're, you're talking to yourself. Um, so I, I would say that to me that, and I think of the sustainability then of going literally from um, the individual right up uh, to that strategic and the infrastructure that we were talking about. If we, if we haven't got that, the top down in there as well, we're never going to get the full picture. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, I suppose uh, me, uh, a little bit piggybacking a little bit on what Marion was saying. For me, I'd like to see us widen the conversation a little bit around academic integrity um, because we've talked a lot about academic integrity in the last year and there's a lot of national campaigns which are really urging our students to, are trying to bring our students into that buy-in about uh, of the conversation about academic integrity. But one thing that's critical that I think that we lose sight of in this conversation in that is that academic integrity should be a two-sided coin and is a two-sided coin and the institutions have to play their part in that conversation too and when we see that the marion referenced that terrifying quote same student same subjects same learning outcomes two years in the difference and the, an assessment instrument in the difference and the assessment in, instrument itself was the thing that made a critical difference to the student and having the ability to uh, to choose another pathway to demonstrate their ability and demonstrate their learning outcomes so i think if we're going to be serious about asking uh, students to be respectful of academic integrity then the, the higher and further education system have to play their part and make sure that students have real pathways to both learning and to, to demonstrate their learning as well so i think the recording angle plays a really important part in that as well because we've seen uh, from an emotional level from the research and the quantitative data in particular from the research launched today, how important that is both in terms of learning, but also in terms of health and well-being for some individuals, you know, that goes beyond a pedagogical issue for, for a lot of our students. Um, so that'd be my but, take. But, but I, I would say, Dara, you know, and um, our other, the other contributors there have mentioned about voice and the necessity to include voice and to, I mean, uh, Richard spoke specifically about NSTEP and uh, around the challenges around that. But equally important uh, to voice, and it links into what you're talking about, is actually actioning and action uh, upon hearing that voice. Uh, so I think that's critically important. And I know uh, from the conference and our conference report, you will see uh, a number of examples are at least of where the student voice wasn't being listened to, the disabled student voice wasn't to, being, being listened to. And I think of uh, the, Pal, the Palmini girl, uh, I can't pronounce her name, yeah. and she spoke of the challenges she faced uh, coming to Ireland and trying to get changes and, and implement it. And even from my own research, I, I have found as well, of course, that disabled students are, find themselves exhausted having to continuously repeat the same thing over and over again. So. As you just pointed out in relation to in academic integrity, it's a two-way street when it comes to voice too. There is voice and there's action. Uh, so I, I think that's important to note. Yeah, absolutely. That's very important. And uh, I suppose the piece in uh, particular around recording and assessment is a voice, not just of disabled students, but it's also right across the system. But we've seen that within student survey, which is more than 40,000 students in higher education and, and data from the IUA, with, with, I think it's around 14,000 students is their uh, piece. So just uh, let's have a little look at what's coming back from the room. Um, so I'm going to read out a few of these comments and then maybe ask uh, from a bit of reflection from the panel if there's anything jumping out. So we see the first commenter here saying we need to remember that no one size 
fits all. So they're talking about UDL being a great place uh, to start in that conversation. And we see that echoed in actually our, our second comment here, that, that piece about being open to flexibility within teaching and learning. And then we have someone saying everything was made accessible. All of a sudden, a recording of lectures allowed use of devices. I think that's really speaking to what you were talking about, Vivian, about the, the calls for these things being happening for a long, long time. Um, listening to our students, they're the expert in what we need to succeed and enjoy their education. So that's really, again, about internalizing that voice and making sure that it's a normal part of practice that we listen to students and actually give them agency in the process of their own learning and how we design our programs. Um, I see here that it's, uh, it's always possible to facilitate UDL, but it took the pandemic to create a necessity for more of that practice to happen. Um, I don't think we should also give the, give the viewpoint here that almost that it has happened. You know, we're still, I think, very early in this journey and there's, there's a long way to go, but we're beginning to see that maybe some of the pandemic learnings have created an environment where it can more easily happen. And um, I see here that somebody has said that accommodations that were previously seen by institutions as too difficult. And that's really harking back to what Vivian is saying, we're, we're suddenly implementable. And that's really about will, isn't it? You know, we have a lot of strategic ambition, but do we have the strategic will? And that's where I kind of think where the cultural bit needs to match with the strategic ambition. So the people on the ground need to believe that it also has to happen as well as the, having the ambition. Otherwise, we, we, we don't get, uh, we don't move things forward. And I think we're beginning to see hopefully both of those things point in the right in the right direction. Somebody's highlighting the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning here. I think that's maybe critical in terms of even referencing what Richard was talking about earlier, the difficulties in structure and motivation. Motivation. I think that's so important, even more important perhaps in the learning from home context than it is in the, the on-campus uh, context. And somebody here talking about the mindset change that's happening. So we're actually seeing educators having to having engaged with all this new professional development, these new modes of learning, that actually maybe it's changing their mindsets and what can and can't be done. And you see somebody's alluding to that here by highlighting the possibilities for accessible learning. Someone here is, is talking about really valuing the work of people done by the likes of a head. Oh, thanks for blushing. <laughs> uh, but ahead and others are like a bridge between HEIs and, and, F, and further education institutes as well. And without this bridge, I'd be trucking along in the environment, not aware of the innovation elsewhere. That's the importance of the two sectors listening to each other. And I think we're hopefully moving towards this more integration between the two ex, uh, sectors and recognizing there's so much that uh, people in further education can learn from higher education and vice versa. There's so much rich practice that's very different that's happening in both. And the fact that anything is possible, I love that finishing on a note of possibility. So any reflections in the, the room there, guys, about the, some of the, the, the comments that have come back here? Well, I, I'd say firstly, they, they remind me of many of the comments that emerged in the conference, Menti, uh, to be honest, in the, in the Menti meter, and the, the whole notion of, you know, keywords again, like flexibility, um, different ways of assessment. Um, you know, UDL and diversity. Uh, so I think what's what's um, consoling about it is that this is a language that we now have a grasp of and, and understand. Um, but equally, uh, there's the call there for even more flexibility, for more understanding um, about the student needs and, and the support for students. Uh, so, and I think that, you know, we will be able to carry that forward. We will be able to address what's coming up there in the Menti um, together, like uh, I think moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. any, any other thoughts there coming from the room, guys? Well, I was just reading that and I was just thinking about, as I was going through it there, that <clears throat> the, the fast pace and the amount of learning that took place uh, during that time, you know, and so many people who had absolutely no experience of uh, using the technology uh, had to totally change uh, their way of working. And it was really quite immense change when you think about it. And what I'm really worried about is that as we, and I've stated this before, but as we move, have moved back now to the, uh, to the, some, the old ways, uh, that we will lose uh, some of th these fantastic uh, learnings. And really, you know, it's, it's really all about building back better. And it's, it's trying to bring what we have learned along with us and ensure that we don't just say, well, that was pandemic time and, and leave it all behind. So I think that's going to be some of the challenge, really, uh, to continue that. Uh, 
And I think it also must be recognised uh, the amount of time and work that it took uh, across both further education and higher education to bring about this massive change, uh, which has been, as we've seen from the surveys, hugely appreciated uh, by students. Uh, and I hope that we continue to build back better and, and listen to that student voice. It would it's very much reminiscent of, of a lot of the submissions which we have which we have um, written um, since pandemic learning, which are asking for what are the paradoxically what advantages have emerged from COVID, and quite a few have. Um, and as as Vivian says, the battle is now to, to, to battle, or the the important thing now is that the these are retained. And it brings me back to the just before I started with a head when I was when I was lecturing in Minute for a couple of years and the panic looking at the other side of the spec the panic that was in departments when when COVID hit that it was literally let's try and get this course over the line it was just total panic um, and I believe lecturers are ready to buy in now and um, I, I I I hope and believe that that lecturers I believe are, are beginning to buy in now because they're seeing. Um, I recall when I first started lecturing online, um, as a as a young lecturer, young as in I was only lecturing a while. I'm not young, <laughs> um, and getting a little bit maybe annoyed that there wasn't as many people there that should have been. You know that maybe they were watching the video later on. You know, and then obviously you realise at the end of the year when the when the work comes in and it's the same standard as every other year, you kind of relax a little bit about it. So then without. You know, I think an understanding of both sides of the dynamic is important. Absolutely. And I do and I do think lecturers are starting to buy in, you know, and that's important. Absolutely. And it should be recognised the huge graph that people put in. Um, you know, it was it was an enormously stressful time. I think something that we maybe haven't come to terms with is the sort of changing nature of some of the roles that have had have happened as a result of all this and, and where the pressures have moved, uh, you know, as a result of all this. So some people maybe are under immense pressure um, because they're certainly taking on, if you like, work from that maybe would have been under somebody else's remit before or maybe didn't exist before at all. Um, so I think that's something that we're still kind of teasing out and figuring out. And I would be concerned about Vivian, as, as I said, uh, that, because it was unsustainable in the way that it was happening, that there may be a, much more of a, a tendency just to, to flick back to the way it was. So it's definitely part of the, the battle for people like ourselves to, to keep pushing that forward. Uh, and Richard, you mentioned not being young yourself, but can't let the session go today without wishing Richard a wonderful 50th birthday. Uh, <laughs> he's, feel, he he aged better. me a few weeks ago and I'm aging him back now on purpose. Uh, but now this is a big happy, happy birthday, 50th, Richard. Happy 50th, Richard. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Thank I, you. I suppose... Just to, to say before we go, an absolutely enormous thank you to our uh, contributors today, uh, to Dr. Vivian Ratt, Dr. Marion McCarthy, and Dr. Richard Healy. I'm, I'm notably doctorless in my own, uh, uh, <laughs> in my own presentation, uh, but listen, I want to thank, make a huge thank you for your guys there, there sharing your, your wisdom and experience with us. Uh, much, much appreciate, and a huge thanks to everyone in the room for engaging both in the chat and in the mentee, and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, just to say that following on from this webinar. Um, you know, I suppose it was referenced within the research and indeed and in what lots of Marion and, and Vivian echoed is that the student desire for more choice in assessment uh, and that was really highlighted in learning from home as well. So our next webinar is actually directly focused on that in the members webinar series. So on November 23rd, we have a, a piece that's all about offering choice in assessment, why and how. So that's going to talk about the research basis for choice as a kind of quality, uh, a mark of quality and how you operate as a practitioner but it's also going to talk about the practicalities of offering choice and in particular how you offer equity within two types of choices you know when you're when you're putting out learning learning pathways for students and ways for students to demonstrate their ability so i think jess is going to pop the link for that in the chat and I urge you to go straight away into that and, and sign up for the next webinar now. Um, as I said, we are at Ahead Ireland if you're a Twitter user, so we'd love to hear what you thought about today's webinar or indeed about the, the research or the conference report that was launched today. So please tag us if you are uh, tweeting. And I just want to wish everybody a lovely evening and hopefully see you all at the next Ahead webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.